and the now gives the floor to the distinguished parliamentary representative of Sri Lanka. Um, sir, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we focus today on Article 5, 11, and 12, which collectively deals with the safeguards as set out in the draft articles. The draft articles focus on the principle of non-refoulement. You will recall that the principle of, uh, was incorporated in several treaties during the 20th century, including the Fourth Geneva Convention, in which Common Article 3 implicitly includes the obligation of non-refoulement. This principle has been replied has been put in place in respect of all aliens and, non -lim and not limited to refugees as popularly thought. The principle of non-refoulement often finds accommodation in extradition treaties. The principle has been recognized in, in 11 and 13 that we are considering. So, so suffice to say that this is a salutary safeguard. Then we have Article 11, which speaks of fair treatment of an alleged offender, including a fair trial and a complete guarantee of its rights under national and international human rights and international humanitarian law. Mr. Chair, it is important to appreciate that the protection of draft Article 11 recognizes the right of such person who is not of the state nationality, who is in custody, and continues to guarantee him that protection throughout the proceedings. We might bear in mind that the ICCPR in Article 14 sets out the standards to be applied to ensure fair treatment. And finally, we have Article 12, which sets out the all important principle that has not been sufficiently, I think, considered until recent times, and that is the protection of victim, victim, victims and witnesses and others to complain of the commission of a crime against humanity that has affected them. Mr. Chairman, while many treaties in the 1980s sought to provide for this requirement, it was only in 1998 when the Rome Statute was put in place that the matter of the rights of victims and witnesses were addressed effectively. Regrettably, many treaties did not define the term, allowing states to apply their existing law and practice so long as it was in consistent with international law. The 2006 International Convention of the Protection of, of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances, the Convention of Cluster Munitions, refer to victims. It is interesting to note that whilst the 1984 Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment did not define the term victim, it did, comment, it did comment three and set out three guidance notes on who would be treated as a victim. However, uh, the term victim guidance, uh, the, term was, uh, the term victim was available uh, to be uh, understood in terms of the guidance that was available in the rules of the tribunal, such as Rule 85A of the Rules of Procedure of the ICC. Mr. Chairman, uh, we asked the question, it, it would appear that what is left to be considered is a post-crime scenario, is the accept of reparation for materials and moral damage on an individual or collective basis for restitution for compensation, satisfaction, rehabilitation, and finally, a cessation and guarantee. It will never guarantee that it will never happen again. In other words, simply put, a mechanism or restorate for restorative justice. We remember that Resolution 3 of, uh, of February 46, recall, calling on states to cooperate in the capture extradition of war criminals was one of the initial steps. Later that year, we had the charter of, of the Nuremberg Tribunal and its judgment in Resolution 95, which was later codified. We then had the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, followed by a series of resolutions that culminated with Resolution 3 not 74 in 1973, which set out the principles of international cooperation in the detection, arrest, extradition, and punishment of persons guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, in 2005, the General Assembly announced a set of basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims of uh, violations of international human rights and uh, a serious violation of international humanitarian law. In 1997, we had Resolution 52, Stroke 135. We had a group of experts who were required to evaluate the existing material and, amongst other things, address the issues of individual accountability. We had thereafter a series of procedures that addressed this issue in different parts of the world. This draft, uh, Mr. Chairman, brings home the message that there is no safe houses for those engaging in crimes against humanity but when apprehended, will be afforded the protection of the law. 
I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished permanent representative of Sri Lanka for his statement.